Awards.com v. Kinko's. Counselor, would you like any rebuttal time? I'd like three minutes. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Alan Railsberg of the firm of Chabourne and Park. With me is Eric Twist, also of my firm, and Chris Gattery of the firm of Berg and Androphy, co-counsel with us on this appeal. This appeal seeks to reverse a judgment of the Appellate Division First Department that granted summary judgment to defendant Kinko's dismissing plaintiff's breach of contract claim. Simply put, plaintiffs, after investing $10 million in the business deal that was the subject of the contract, had that business destroyed when Kinko's terminated the agreement suddenly and without any prior notice by reason of plaintiff's purported delay in making a single monthly payment of less than $50,000. So you're saying the defendants here waived their right to terminate the contract by accepting late payments? That is one of the arguments, Your Honor. We're arguing both that there was no material breach and, in addition, that there was a waiver. Well, there is a no waiver clause, though, right? There is a no waiver clause, but — What's the significance of that? I think in this instance, not a lot, Your Honor, because the no waiver clause, as opposed to the no oral modification clause, simply says that a waiver needs to be in writing. And there are really two aspects of the waiver argument here. First, the simplest argument is look at the facts relating to the specific payment. The contract says the payment is due on September 15th, yet the invoice for the specific August payment in dispute, the invoice is issued on September 16th in writing accompanied by an email. So you say that's a written waiver? Yes. Or at least it is an issue of fact, Your Honor, that should have gone to the jury because you have not only the invoice, but you also have the email that says any questions, please let me know. What about the language that says the failure of either party to enforce any provision of this agreement shall in no way be construed to be a waiver of such provision? Isn't that a problem for you? Not really, I think, Your Honor, because there are two aspects, as I started to say, about the waiver argument. I think the language you're going to, Judge Smith, goes more to the pattern here. There were waivers all along throughout the course of the contract. Kinko's accepted the payments repeatedly without complaint. And that, I believe, is a waiver of those payments, as both courts below found. Now, going to your point. But it doesn't matter because they did that. You weren't terminated for those. Correct. So it's not a waiver of their ability to enforce an existing contract provision. So you say you have a waiver applicable to this particular missed payment. Two arguments, Your Honor. You have a waiver applicable to this particular payment because the September 16th and the September 23rd invoices both were accompanied by e-mails in writing saying any questions, please let me know. But in addition, and this is important going to your point, Judge Smith, the waivers that had occurred previously can certainly be withdrawn. If you look at the cases, conceptually, the way this works is if you've waived all along and you've accepted the payment, you don't lose your right to enforce a subsequent payment. But the cases are clear that if you're going to do it, you're in effect withdrawing the prior waiver. You must give notice that you're now going to enforce the date of the 15th. Why didn't you pay what you thought you owed for August? Well, the answer is very simple, Your Honor. The invoice comes out on the 23rd. There's back and forth, as you can see in the record, between the parties as to what the proper amount is for August. On September 16th, or it may have been September 18th, I believe, my client paid the June and July, May, June and July invoices, about $120,000. There was not an agreement as to what the correct amount should be for August. My client says to Kinko's, you billed us in the wrong amount, let's get it straightened out. The corrected invoice comes September 23rd. There's no notice in that, with that invoice saying you have to pay immediately or we're going to throw you out of here. So we had two days to pay. So the answer to your question is no. Many contracts do provide for that sort of notice and grace period. This one didn't. Correct. Well, that's arguable also, Your Honor, because there is, in fact, a provision in 6.1 of the contract that we've argued in the briefs does apply and includes notice and an opportunity to cure provision. But 
you don't need to interpret it our way, in my view, to have a reversal here and um, have a trial on the issue of both waiver and breach. Because why, why are the why is this issue not a material breach, since there isn't a grace period in the contract? I think that one is also pretty simple, Your Honor. Because the contract says the payments are to be on the 15th day of each month. There's no grace period. There's no other kind of notice provision in that particular paragraph. Absolutely. You go back to Hornbook law, which we've set forth in the brief. There are at least three Hornbook principles worth keeping in mind. There's some others as well. Number one, most important. For a breach to be material, it has to go to the root of the agreement between the parties and be so substantial that it defeats the object or purpose of the contract. And the Hornbook principle is that is materiality is ordinarily a question of fact, and the trier of fact is to look at all of the facts and circumstances, including those circumstances existing at the time of the alleged breach. The so you're not arguing that it was or wasn't material. You're arguing that it's a question of fact that should have gone to a jury, and summary judgment shouldn't have been granted here. Uh, I, I think one could argue that this was, in fact, no material breach as a matter of law. But yes, Your Honor, we are only arguing that this should go to the jury because the issue here is the timing of the payment, not whether or not the payment was made. The issue is, is, is a failure to pay on that precise date a material breach. And the I fact that there were negotiations going on or rumblings about, about Kinko taking over awards, um, does that play into this? In it any does play into it, Your Honor, because I think when you look at the issue of what was the purpose of this contract and you look at whether this alleged breach uh, defeated the purpose <clears throat> of the contract, it is relevant to look at what the actual motive is. And I think what the record shows is that the actual motive here for Kinko's in terminating had nothing to do with late payments. That was a pretextual reason. What the record shows, what happened here, is when the parties entered into this deal, Kinko's was hoping that eventually they could buy the company, buy Inspire and Awards. What happens in the summer of 2003 is that Awards gets an offer to sell itself to Aramark. And awards goes to Gary Cousin, who's the CEO of Kinko's, and says, we have this opportunity. What happens then is Gary Cousin is upset because he thinks the, the, the other party of the contract is about to sell to someone else. And now he looks at the contract that his lawyers uh, entered into, and he realizes two things. Number one, he realizes that he doesn't have a right of first refusal. And number two, he realizes there's no termination date in this contract. But, but if, a, if, if there was a material breach, can't they, don't they have the right to terminate for any motive? He, if the breach is material, their motive doesn't matter, does Absolutely, it? Your Honor. If the breach actually is material, then it does uh, not and, matter. And aren't there cases that basically say being late with your rent is a material breach? There are cases in the rent context that say that. I think this is not a commercial lease. Kinko's doesn't argue that it is. They call it, as they should, a license fee. And, and no, the, but we are always concerned with having well-articulated rules in the commercial arena because we want to keep New York's prominence as a commercial site. What's the rule here that you're asking us to articulate, considering that there was a no-waiver provision in this contract? I, I think the rule we're asking you to articulate here is that the issue of material breach is a fact intensive inquiry on a case-by-case -case basis where the court, and in this instance I think a jury, needs to consider whether in this instance a failure to pay on a precise date defeats the purpose of the contract. And while you can have certain types of contract, like a commercial lease, where there is really no question, Judge Graffio, that in a commercial lease it's the essence of the contract that you pay the rent on time. That is the essence of the contract. Or you can have a contract for the sale of real estate where you have the opposite inference that the closing date is not of the essence of the contract. Why is this different from a lease? I mean, you were, I mean, whether you call it a lease or a license fee, you were paying and you were occupying their space. Well, the reason it's different is because when you look at the entire record, and I think the jury should have been given that opportunity to consider it, this deal is not about the rental of space. This is a deal where Kinko's and Inspired 
Inspire went into this together for the purpose of trying to grow a business and share profits. It is not a rent payment. It is a revenue sharing payment with a minimum guarantee uh, that was uh, being paid with an additional amount to be paid if the revenues from the business reached a certain level. So is it of no importance that you make timely payment? No, I wouldn't say that, Your Honor. Well, it depends what, what you mean. What, what is the significance of the, the I think payments the, every month? I think the significance, the payments obviously had significance. The precise date is ah, not something okay. that has significance. So, so timeliness is not critical. Correct, Your Honor. I mean, look at it very simply. Suppose I entered into a contract tomorrow. Very simple. I'm going to invest $20 million in this business. I'm going to give you monthly payments uh, uh, for, for uh, you allowing me to put the business into your operation, and I agree to pay you on September 15th. And now I'm one day late in the first payment. I should lose my $20 million? My client invested $10 million, $10 million, undisputed in the record, directly in this business. They'd invested $45 million total what in What would business. you have to do to lose your payment? You have to be really late. I think, yes. You, I mean, there is some time limit. There would be a reasonable time construed here. Or at a minimum, Kinko's could have at some point gone to us and said, hey, maybe we've accepted it all along, but now we want it on the 15th. We mean business, and you got to so do it. The fact that you were chronically late, because you were chronically late, um, that cannot be excused at this point. Not they, they had an obligation. They, had, they couldn't say, okay, enough. <laughs> they had an obligation to give you notice and, and say, well, you've been chronically late, but now I'm not going to take this I'm anymore. saying before they could insist on the 15th being a precise date, assuming it ever could be in this contract, yes, given the history, they had an obligation but in the could case be, of support. But it, it could be? If they said that, that would be okay? Yes, I think if they... If they said, look, this is it, then, then this is a material least, breach. I, I think you still might have reasonable notice. In other words, if on September 23rd they had said, uh, we mean it, you need to pay in... 30 days, that would be an easy one. If they said you need to pay tomorrow, I don't know. If they said five days, maybe okay. But the point here is not only didn't they do it, they did the opposite. Because what they did is they kept saying, any questions, please let me know. And that's why motive, Judge Smith, has some relevance here, some relevance. Because going back to Judge Saparic's question, what, what happens here is, is they want it out of this thing. And one week before the termination, one week, it's on page 29 of our uh, opening brief, the CEO of Kinko's sends an email to uh, the private equity firm that then owned Kinko's, and he says, we're not happy with our agreement with Inspire. It isn't nearly as buttoned down as it should be on the rules of disengagement. So we're going to attempt to rewrite our agreement at this juncture in return for meeting with Aramark. He was looking for an out. He was looking for a pretext. The email said nothing about payments being late, and the termination letter itself has grounds that at the end of the day, even Kinko's is conceding now aren't the actual grounds. They had all kinds of other things in that letter. But that the they actual now grounds in your mind was because they couldn't buy you out anymore or couldn't bring you in anymore. That was... I'm, I'm sorry. What's the, what, so, so what exactly... Why were they so mad? Because you I were think the reason dallying they were, with this other... Because, they, because we were dealing with Aramark and also because I believe... The CEO looked at the contract that he probably hadn't looked at closely enough before and realized he didn't have a right of first refusal, and there's no termination date. Were they dealing with FedEx at the time? Kinko's at the time had FedEx, um, uh, FedEx locations within their stores, so in effect FedEx and Inspire were competing for the same space, and that we believe is another ulterior motive here that the jury should have considered. Uh, because, as, uh, as in the record, FedEx acquired Kinko's a few months later. And so the competition for the space may have been another factor. How were the payments com uh, computed? They were computed by a calculation based on the square foot uh, in, uh, in each of the stores, the stores within the stores. Wasn't part of the agreement that you were going to develop more sites? More stores. More part stores. of the agreement was that we would ultimately 
roll this out on a nationwide basis, which happened. Kinko's was happy with the deal, and a few months into the deal, uh, Kinko's waived the so-called test period and agreed to go forward with the rollout on a nationwide basis. Uh, maybe I should turn for, to the lost profits issue yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and, and go through that quickly in the time that I have remaining. On the lost profits, obviously you don't get the lost profits unless you uh, go away on the breach issue. We do submit on the issue of material breach and on waiver that there are fact issues for the jury. Similarly, I think there are fact issues for the jury on the issue of lost profit damages. <laughs> And in the first instance, the jury, not the court, should actually determine whether these are general damages or consequential damages that we're talking about, because it's not so clear. And as one of the cases says, uh, it's elusive sometimes to apply uh, the definitions of general and consequential damages, which themselves are clear. Uh, that seems a funny reason for giving it to a jury, that it's an elusive uh, distinction of, uh, between two technical concepts. Why let a jury decide that? Well, I understand what you're saying, uh, Your Honor, but I would say this. General damages, as you all know, are the natural and probable consequences of the breach. Consequential damages go to uh, a situation where there are collateral damages. So if you have a lease, like in Greasy Spoon, where there's a restaurant, the restaurant is adding a sidewalk cafe, uh, the damages are collateral because they come from the restaurant's customers. Here, the customers are Kinko's own customers. This is a natural flow. The jury could be instructed. There should be a full trial record. And if the jury's instructed and it's not general damages, then you go to the consequential damage analysis. How are they contemplated and measurable, these damages? The damages are measurable. The simple answer situation. to that is Kinko's itself did an analysis of lost profits, and if you look at their analysis, they disagree with our projections of damages of lost profits, but Kinko's, when they were considering buying it, Kinko's did their own analysis. So the issue is not what the amount should be, and the fact that Kinko's thinks that our amount is too high begs the question. The question is, how could it not be reasonably certain of measurement when Kinko's itself has done their own analysis. Okay, counsel. Good afternoon, judges. May it please the court, I am Terrence Reed, and I am appearing on behalf of the appellee Kinko's in this appeal. Uh, first, I, I want to address what this agreement was about. Whether you refer to it as a licensing agreement or a lease, it was for Inspire to pay Kinko's a sum of money on the 15th of each, each month in exchange for Inspire occupying space within the Kinko's stores. That is what this, this agreement was yeah, about. But you admit you were pretty lax about that 15th of the month uh, deadline, right? No, I would not characterize. Weren't in the past before this particular incident? I would not characterize Kinko's allowing Inspire to get on the ball and pay timely as being laxed. And it shouldn't be prejudiced by. When you bill them the day after it's due, that's not sort of uh, carving out a different arrangement? Absolutely not. There is no provision in the agreement at all which requires any invoices. Had you ever been late before? Had. Had. Inspire ever been late in making payments? During the test period, it was not late. Only after the test period was over did it consistently make late payments. And, and, you, and you complained every single time? No, no. But oh. Kinko's complained in person on September 15th in a meeting. How did you get the bill wrong? It, I, the reason I asked your opponent what the, how much the charge was, that if it's $150 a foot, how could you get the bill wrong? such that Kinko's had to, or that awards had to tell you that you underbilled them? Because there, there was turnover in the accounting department. At, at a certain point in time... So you made a mistake. They told you you made a mistake. You sent them a bill, and two days later you default them because they didn't pay the bill that you mistakenly sent them incorrectly that they had you correct. Kink, Kinko's was never obligated to send what you're calling a bill, what they call an invoice. There was never an obligation for them to send an invoice. Kink, as one of the judges pointed out, Inspire should have and could have paid what they thought they owed, even if they didn't pay that amount. I'm they just wondering why that becomes material all of a sudden. If, if you've got a company that's ongoing that, that seems to be providing you with a substantial amount of income and, uh, and everything's going along smoothly, you send them a bill. You've, you've been sending them a bill. 
You send them a bill that's incorrect. They correct you, not by telling you that, that you've charged them too much, but that you've charged them too little. You then send them a bill and say, because you didn't pay this within two days, you are in breach, and therefore this entire operation is gone. The, the reason that it was always timely payment was was all ma always material. Well, that's why I asked you why you you know I, as you said you you complained every single time and and you told them every single time we're sending you this invoice but it's only as a courtesy, and that was not a business practice that you engaged in. That was just a courtesy that you extended to them at the time that you were complaining because they were late. Either that's true or it's not, and I think it's not. I think that there was a pattern here that seemed to indicate that the business was going along fine and you were making a pretty good amount of money. No, th th there was not a pattern, and the business was not going along fine. In, in the payment schedule that they rely upon, and this is in the record on page 639, when Kinko said we will send you a, a payment schedule, it also reiterated the language of the agreement and stated, quote, awards.com to pay Kinko's monthly in arrears in pro rata portions on the 15th day of the following month, end quote. That was always understood. It was never a precondition for Kinko's to send an invoice in order to get payment. Well, so when, when you stopped, sent, when Kinko stopped sending the invoices in February of 2003, then weren't they late for a couple of months? When you say it, it's not true that Kinko stopped sending a, an invoice. Kinko's never sent an invoice well, during in the test Well, in February period. 2003, they didn't pay in a timely fashion. They didn't pay by the 15th of the month, correct? That is correct. It went a couple of months without them paying, correct? They, 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 yeah, they never paid by the 15th of the month. And That's correct. you folks didn't, de your client didn't declare a material breach of the contract at that juncture? Not in February. We did not. On September 15th, when the vice what, what bearing does that have then it, 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 on this on this case? It, it doesn't have any bearing because the parties negotiated and agreed upon a very clear non-waiver provision. Was this a ticking time bomb then? I mean, you knew you knew that they, they, there was now a pattern and practice of the way these payments were being made, and did you kind of have that as a as an ace up your sleeve, saying any time we want to get out of this contract now, we can just tell them we're out of the contract because you didn't pay last month. Uh, on a timely basis. No, it's not a ticking time bomb. It, it, it is a provision that the parties negotiated and agreed upon, as, as is the clear non-waiver provision that Your Honor points out, which states, quote, the failure of either party to enforce any provision of this agreement shall in no way be construed to be a waiver of such provision, nor in any way to affect the right of either party to enforce each and every provision yeah, but they of this say, agreement. But thereafter. they say some of the written back and forth is, is more than, than uh, you know, goes beyond that <clears throat> provision that you have. It's almost like a written waiver by saying, look, here, here's what I'm sending. If you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to call. Yeah, yeah, if you have questions. What, question, is, what no. does that do? That has no significance? It, it has no significance. It, if you have questions, call does not meet the threshold that this court set in fundamental portfolio that says it must be a clear, unmistakable relinquishment of a known right, whether it's a contract right, a statutory right, or a common law right. To have the phrase, if any questions, please ask, it does not constitute an unmistakable, clear manifestation of the relinquishment of a right. Do you think you had to give them uh, uh, notice if you were going to be more strict in terms of the payment? After the, the history of what had gone on here, do you think that you needed to say to them, listen, whatever has gone on in the past, we're really now going to hold you to, to these dates. Do you have any obligation to do that? And in the normal course, isn't that normally what, what would happen in a, a dealing like this where kind of you let it go and you let it go? Wouldn't you, don't you have a little bit of an obligation to say, gee, if things are changing now, you, you better pay up exactly on time? No, no, Your Honor. We had no. Why not? We had, be, because of the clear language of the non-waiver provision. Well, then what inspired you, if you use a term, uh, to rather than breach them on the 23rd to send them an invoice? I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, you, what's the question? On September 23rd, 2003, after they told you you would underbuild them, you sent them an invoice. I mean, why didn't you say you're in breach? Because we, we told them, we informed them on the 15th that they were in breach. 
during a meeting between the, the <coughs> vice president of retail for Kinko's and the CEO of awards, they met in Dallas. There was a discussion in where they said, listen, listen these untimely payments are a problem. You need to start paying wouldn't, by the wouldn't, it, wouldn't it have been a normal, more straightforward business practice for you to say at that meeting, get the money in or we're going to terminate? What, what we said during that meeting is that your untimely payments are a problem. You need to start paying by the 15th of the month. And, and, and eight days later, you terminate them. We, we, could, we terminate could, on the would, 25th. Would, if you're in their position, wouldn't you have been unpleasantly surprised? Uh, Were we unpleasantly surprised that they didn't they, pay? You, wouldn't you have been unpleasantly surprised? I mean, you have a conversation with someone. He says, you've got, you got late payments. You've got you to fix them. Uh, they fixed, I guess, three of them, but left a fourth one out there because there was some difference in the bill. Eight days later, they get a termination notice. Didn't they have a right to be kind of surprised? No, they didn't have a right to be surprised. These are sophisticated commercial parties who are represented by teams of attorneys when they entered into this agreement. The provisions are clear. What Inspire is asking the court to do is to allow them to get around. No, the why, terms why isn't of it a question of fact? I mean, if you tell them you've got to get current, we're tired of this. You got you got to get current, and they send you a check uh, for one hundred twenty thousand dollars, roughly, and they say. The, the, the one bill we're not paying is that it, you, you didn't bill us enough. Why don't they have the right to say we're now complying with what the discussion was on the 15th, which is we've got to become current? We gave them $120,000. We're willing to pay them the last part. Yet they just got to fix their bill. You fix the bill, and they're prepared to pay it. Only you give them two days, and, you, and you, uh, it, it seems to me that you've gone back on the deal you, so, you made with them on the 15th. And let's assume you're not. Isn't that at least a question of fact? No, it's not. The whole reason for a no oral modifi modification clause is so, like Your Honor said, there won't be some reliance on a particular conversation. You're tied to the terms of this agreement. I agree with and that, the, but I'm, I'm, I'm more focused, I think, on the materiality, because it didn't seem to bother you. I mean, it, it, it bothered you at some point where you now say make it current, and they mail you a check for 120 grand. Why didn't you mail the $120,000 back and say, you know, you're in breach and we're not accepting any more of your payments and you've got 30 days to get out of our stores? B because Kinko's elected to accept rent for three months that was late. And this, there's, a, there's a confusion that Inspire has between the doctrine of election of remedies and waiver or materiality. Kinko's has an absolute right to choose between whether it wants to accept late payment and continue with the agreement or whether it wants to terminate the agreement because so of the late payment. So each time this happens, if they want to just send a termination notice, if you wanted to send a termination notice, that would be okay with no further notice saying, gee, we're changing the rules of the game. We may have led you on a little bit over. We may have said this is okay. Now it's not. At any time, based upon the contract, your interpretation is you could always say one day later, terminate it. That is correct, because, Your Honor. Because non-payment is a material breach under this contract. Th that is correct, Your Honor. Each time that Inspire... Where does it say in the contract that non-payment is a material breach? What it says in the contract is, is very clear that the 15th of the month, of the following month, is the date. It also incorporates New York law and, and states in all caps that the terms of this agreement shall be governed and construed by New York law. New York law, and this court in particular, has been clear for over a century that, and I quote, a covenant to pay rent at a specified time is an essential part of the, bar of the bargain as it represents the consideration to be received for permitting the tenant to remain in possession of the property of the landlord. Even in this kind of contract, which your adversary is saying this is a little different kind of contract. A absolutely, because this contract, the essence of it is for Inspire to pay Kinko's a sum to, to possess This is space. commercial rent period in your mind, that, that's what it is? Yes, Your Honor, and I want to point out in the record on page 178 through 179, the CEO of awards, when he was asked, how do you characterize these payments, he, he characterized them on his own as rent payments. In essence, they are rent payments. Whether you characterize them as rent payments, license payments, the nature of the agreement is the same. Payment for the use of space within Kinko's stores. Yeah. Now, what if we disagree with you and we send it back for a trial on this issue? What would be the measure of damages? Are they entitled to their lost profits, or what would be the measure of damages? They are absolutely not entitled to their lost profits for, for several reasons. One, there's no evidence that the, that the parties contemplated that Kinko's would be liable 
for lost profits in the event of, of a breach. First of all, when we get to that, because it's clear that the damages that they seek are general, or sorry, are consequential lost profit damages as opposed to general damages. The Second Circuit in Tractabell clearly distinguished between the two. They define consequential damages as, quote, lost profits are consequential damages when, as a result of the breach, the non-breaching party suffers loss of profits on collateral business arrangements. In a typical case, the ability of the non-breaching party to operate his business and therefore generate profits on collateral transactions is contingent on the performance of the primary contract. These collateral business arrangements, as opposing counsel stated, come from customers who want to utilize the services of well, what would be an example of direct lost profit damages? Direct, direct lost profit damages would be if under the contract, Kinko's was obligated to pay Inspire a sum of money. There's no such provision under the contract. You know, a, a share of their profits? No. N n no. If, if, for example, taking this out, if, if a party contracted to sell its services to party B and then there was a breach of the contract. I see. So it's just the, that you had a profit built into the purchase price, you would say that was direct loss <coughs> profits. Yeah, direct loss profits would be money under the contract flowing directly from the alleged the, breaching the, the, party the, the, to the, the non The profits you are going to make on, on renting your space or selling your potatoes or whatever it is to, to the other party. R yes. But under the contract, Kinko's, under no circumstances, ever would, was obligated to pay Inspire any money. And that's the reason that these are not general damage and they're consequential. So, so under consequential damages, the damages need to be within the contemplation of the parties. N there is no evidence in the contract or in the record that evidences that Kinko's ever assumed any liability for lost profits in the event of, of a breach. What Inspire relies upon is that they say, well, the parties talked about Inspire making a profit. But this court in Kenford Company, Inc., the, the second one in 1989, Hell that a hope or expectation of future profit does not necessarily or logically lead to the conclusion that the parties contemplated that the defendant would assume liability for plaintiff's lost future profits in the event of the breach. That's what we have here. Just because the parties thought at one point that Inspire may turn itself around, be a viable company, and make a profit, although it never did, that does not lead to the conclusion that... Well, wasn't that the whole purpose of, the, of there being in your... Uh, uh, shops. Absolutely. There, there was a hope. I mean, that, that was, I mean, you both contemplated they would make a profit, right? We both hoped that they would make a profit. But just because there is an expectation or a hope that a company will make a profit does not lead to the conclusion that one party assumed liability for lost profits in the event of the breach. And that, that is the, what this court very clearly held. The payments here were just based on square footage calculations, At, not on revenue or Absolutely. receivables at all? The, the monthly payments were easily calculated. You take the, the square foot, the, the price per square foot times the actual square foot. Inspire had the, the information all along, each month, to calculate how much it owed Kinko's. There was no need for an invoice. They knew exactly how much they owed. But these which were, in theory, minimum payments, I gather. The, yeah, the, yes, if they, they were minimum If they had made a lot of money, then it would have been, become a more complicated calculation? Ha, had they made a profit, then Kinko's would have received a percentage I'm, I'm of, trying to understand why there was a dispute as to what they owed for August if it's just a straight square footage calculation. The, the only reason that there was a dispute was because th that was the point where the amount per square foot changed. <coughs> it, the amount per square foot changed starting in July, which would have been the August payment. That, that, that's the only reason. That Period? That's it? It had nothing to do with not because any profits, revenue. lack of profit. It had revenue. No, it had absolutely nothing to so do the, with the number, the number per square foot went up? No, the price per square foot changed. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the price per square foot went up, and, the, and, and your, your people missed it, and they pointed it out to you? That's right. That's right. And, and they could have all, I mean, it, it's undisputed that they had all the information they needed to make payments. The, the, now that they're claiming that they didn't make payment because they didn't receive an invoice is a subterfuge. It is I don't a think they're saying that. I, it was, what, it, what it seems to me is, I mean, they could have, you're right, they could have mailed you 
uh, I guess you billed them 39, it should have been 49 or something. They could have mailed you a check for 49, but they sent it to you so you could fix your invoice. An, an invoice? And you did. An, an, we did. Yes, we did. So on, you, on set, the you sent them the invoice. I mean, I, I would think that they would then assume, well, now we got the invoice, that we both agree it's 49, whatever it's supposed to be, and they're ready to, ready to check, and you say, sorry, you're in breach. This is an invoice, again, that Kinko's is not obligated to send. And I no understand one that. I, I just don't understand why you sent it then. In other words, it just seems to be at some point when you keep doing this and then say, well, we didn't have to do it, and the fact that we did it and they relied on us to do it, and in fact the one we sent was wrong and they made it and they fixed it for us, all of that in yours to our benefit and not theirs, and we can breach them any time we want. Because, because it's not reasonable for them to rely on, on an invoice for several reasons. First. They don't need an invoice to know exactly how much they owe. If they had Second, paid you, if they had paid you the thirty-nine thousand, you could have breached them that. If, if if they had if they had made a payment, if they had made the payment by the fifteenth of the month for thirty-nine thousand, like, they'd have been ten thousand short, and you could have breached them. No, because they didn't pay the amount on the fifteenth. I, I, I'm sorry, I thought your honor said that if they had made the payment, they by did, the 15th, but it was the incorrect amount. They paid, the, they paid the low number that you billed them for. If, if they had, if, even if they had paid that $39,000 amount by the 15th, which, of course, they did not, then I, I, I'm speculating. I will speculate that Kinko's would not have terminated the agreement. But, 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 but on your theory, they could have. On my theory, they could have. If, had they not paid the amount, the correct amount, on the 15th, Having all the knowledge that they needed to make the payment, and, and it's undisputed that they did, yes. But even, it, even though you invoice them for the for the lesser amount, yes, that, uh, and, that, that and really would defy common logic, wouldn't you? Think? If no. you bother to invoice them gratuitously and say you owe me thirty nine thousand dollars, and they pay you or whatever it is, and they pay you that amount, you are still going to terminate them because they should have known what you didn't know. What the correct amount was? The, this, the, yes, this is the reason. Because I'm relying on this court's opinion in Vermont Teddy Bear, which in essence states that a court cannot change the contract. We are relying on the specific terms of a contract that was negotiated by two sophisticated commercial parties represented by counsel. Yeah, but they think you're, this, a, you're a sophisticated uh, uh, you know, entity and that you're sending them the right amount. And, and they're correct. And, and we, Kinko's, relied on the strict terms of the contract. This court stated, quote, courts should be extremely reluctant to interpret an agreement as impliedly stating something which the parties have neglected to specifically include. Hence, courts may not, by construction, add or excise terms, nor distort the meaning of those used and thereby make a new contract for the parties under the guise of interpreting the writing, end okay. quote. Okay, counsel. Thanks. Thank you. Counsel Rebuttal. Assuming this court uh, were to send the case back for trial on the issue of breach of contract, which could be, I think it was a ticking time bomb, it could be based on materiality, the, the jury should consider waiver or even equitable estoppel. Assuming it goes back, then the issue is, as, as one of your honors said, what is the measure of damages? And there, too, there are fact issues. Let's take the issue, I think, Judge Lippman, you were asking me before, was there a contemplation of liability for lost profits. That issue should be determined on a full trial record by the trier of fact. Is that, is, is that always an issue for the jury, whether the parties contemplated lost profits? No, Your Honor. It what, what makes this special? What makes this, I don't know if it makes it special, but what makes this one of the cases where it should be are a variety of factors. The court's rule, of course, is one of common sense, and jurors can apply common sense. And what makes this case fit into that category, Judge Smith, is that this deal was all about profits. Council misspoke when he said the rent was only about square foot. That's not true. The deal was at a certain level of revenue, there would be additional revenue share but payments. That was, but, they, but they say you weren't at that level or anything to do with that. That is if correct. this was mechanical at this point. At time, this right? point, it was yeah. mechanical, but going to the lost profits, right. what was contemplated by the parties, they didn't enter into this for mechanical. Right. It was a more complex It was formula. a complex yeah. deal to make profits for both sides. So if there's a commercial lease that sets a certain ceiling at which point then there's going to be a percentage of revenue those those kinds of commercial leases are all going to be lost profit cases 
No, because this is not a case where you've got to understand the business. The business here is that Awards has an established business. Kinko's has an established business. Awards is taking their established business online. They're bringing it to Kinko's stores. The target customer base are corporations that want to personalize golf balls or invitations or things to do marketing. Kinko's customers base is the perfect customer base <laughs> for that. There's synergies for everybody here. The customers that come into Kinko's stores may want to buy awards products. The people who might want to buy awards products are now in Kinko's to use Kinko's services. That's what this deal was about. This is not a commercial lease. The, the profits are not collateral. The profits are Kinko's profits. The sales are to Kinko's customers. And there is a fact issue here whether under this court's common sense rule, liability for lost profits was contemplated. Okay, counsel. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it.